If you have your Bible, turn with me again to Luke chapter 16, verse 19. Jesus said there was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for the scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died and was buried. He went to the place of the dead. There in torment, he saw Abraham, and in the distance, was with, he was with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted, and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted, and you are in anguish. And besides, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over from you to here, and no one can cross over from us to there. Verse 27, then the rich man said, please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home, for I have five brothers, and I, want, I don't want them to end up in this place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, no, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent from the dead, they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said they won't listen. If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. I want you to pray with me now. Father, we come to you in Jesus' matchless name. And right now we ask that you would make ready the hearts of your people to receive the word of truth. I pray, God, that you would pierce our hearts today with your word, that you would shape us and change us, that those who are far from you would find salvation in Christ today. Those who are already following you would become more like you, and I pray you'd be strong in my weakness because I need you today. May my life in this church be forever, be hidden behind the cross. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. So today's sermon is called Life After Death, and we're going to be answering the question, what happens when I die? This is the age-old question that centuries and all people of all backgrounds have wondered and pondered this question, what happens when we die? The Bible answers this, and in Luke chapter 16, Jesus himself peels back the veil of death and eternity and allows us to see beyond the other side and to see what life truly is beyond death. I want to warn you that this is a powerful sermon. It is going to be in your face, um, not coming to make friends today, but this is one of the most important messages that I could ever preach to you. So over the next few moments, we're going to work our way through these 12 verses, and I pray that God's word illuminates inside of your heart. The first thing I want to draw your attention to is this is not a parable. Help me preach. Tell your neighbor, this is not a parable. Not a parable, all right? Many well-meaning preachers have taken this text and taught it as a parable, but there are two reasons we know this is not a parable. This is an actual historical event that transpired. Number one, anytime Jesus introduced a parable, he would say things like, and the kingdom of heaven is like this, or the kingdom of heaven is like that. He would always use those introductory phrases when introducing a, par a parable. Here he does none of that. He just comes right out. The other reason we know that this is not a parable is because Jesus uses actual names. He calls Lazarus by name. He calls Abraham by name. Friends, this is not a parable. This is literally a look behind the veil to see what happens after we die. The first man you need to be acquainted with, though, to understand it is the rich man. 
The Bible said he lived an opulent and luxurious life. He was adorned with the finest garments. They were purple and expensive clothing that he wore. The Bible also says that he dined very well. He lived from feast to feast. In the ancient world, um, a normal citizen would be doing well to have one great expensive meal a year. The Bible and historians tell us this rich man likely had a feast every single day of his life. It was like Thanksgiving every single day at his house. The food was exotic, it was expensive, and he had an overabundance, more than enough, that he himself could not even consume. In contrast, we see a man who was very close in proximity, yet he was in an entirely different world, and that is the poor man, the beggar, Lazarus. Lazarus, in contrast, he laid every day beside the gate of the rich man, and every day he would beg for the bread that would fall from his table. Historians tell us that this is not just a figure of speech. 2,000 years ago plus, the wealthy, when they were done eating, they would literally wipe their dirty hands on bread, the heel of the bread or part of the bread that was going to be discarded to clean their hands. And then they would discard those pieces of bread out into the street where the beggars and the poor would consume it. That's the visual picture that you have to understand. But the Bible says Lazarus wasn't just poor monetarily, he was poor physically. The Bible said that he had open wounds all across his body that were profusely bleeding and pouring out. I know we're getting you ready for lunch, right? Real appetizing, okay? The Bible said that he was so poor physically that even the dogs would come and lick his wounds. There couldn't have been a more stark contrast between the rich man and Lazarus, the beggar. These men, again, they were so close, but they were worlds apart. The Bible actually doesn't tell us of any great sin that the rich man committed other than he neglected and ignored Lazarus every day of his life. I want you to realize this, that likely the first time the rich man passed by Lazarus at the gate, his heart was probably moved. He probably was caught off guard and maybe did one act of generosity or kindness. We don't know. But after the days turned into weeks and the weeks turned into months, the rich man became calloused and numb to the presence of Lazarus, so much so that he passed him by without even a second thought. The rich man was so busy with his own affairs, so preoccupied with his own money and his own problems and issues that he overlooked Lazarus entirely, too concerned with his own life. I want to ask you a question before we go any further this morning. I wonder who is laying at your gate? Who is within an arm's reach of help that you could serve, that you could comfort, that you could encourage? Who is it at your work, at your apartment complex, in your own family, that you are capable of comforting and helping and serving, yet you walk right past them? The reality is all of us, like the rich man, have somebody that we're able to help and serve and comfort, and we must not be self-centered and so consumed with our own life that we overlook the needs of others. If you have your Bible, look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. If you're slow flipping, it's on the screen. If someone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar, for he does not love God. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love a God who he's not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. What did Jesus tell us were the greatest two commandments? Love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is not just a suggestion. This is a commandment for every born-again Christian. It's one thing to honor God with your words, but it's another thing to honor God with your life, with your decisions, with your time and generosity. I want you to understand that we are called as Christians to have compassion on the needs of others. We are called to comfort the afflicted. 
And if we can make a difference in the life of someone, we by all means should. Please hear me, as a Christian, you're not called to save every homeless person, to rescue every person from poverty. We're not called to do everything for all people, but we are called to do something for somebody. And if everybody does something for somebody, the needs of all will be met. Anybody believe what I'm saying today? About three of you do. Independence, I know you're clapping. I know you're with me. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, Jesus goes on and teaches the very same principle. Listen to this. The context of Matthew 25 is the great judgment. All of humanity, both great and small, kings and peasants alike, all stand before the judgment seat of God, and they're separated in this moment. Those on the right who are God's sheep and those on the left who are the goats, who are selfish. Listen to Matthew 25. Then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. I was naked, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Verse 44, then they will also answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it unto the least of these, so you did it unto me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. Church, you have to feel the magnitude of this. On the day of judgment, Christ says to the sheep, the righteous, he says, when I was poor, you met my need. When I was naked, you clothed me. And I was sick, you visited me. And they answered, Lord, when did we ever see you like this? He said, and such as you've done to the least of these, so you've done it unto me. He says to the unrighteous, when I was sick, you never visited. When I was there, you never came for me. You never helped me. You never gave me drink. The scripture is warning us that such as we've done unto the least of these, that's how we've treated God. It's one thing to come in here every Sunday and honor God and sing the lyrics of Maverick City and Hill Song, but how you live your life is the mark of true Christianity. And how you treat the lowest common person in your life, how do you treat people that can't do anything for you? How do you treat the least significant person in your social sphere? Because that's the picture of how you treat God Almighty. I know it's not a feel-good sermon. It's convicting even to me. But I'm telling you, we must realize that we are fooling ourselves if we say we love God, but we have disrespect, enmity, or think we're better self-righteous than any other person on earth. How can you love a God who is invisible if you can't love those who are made in his image? I know people are annoying sometimes, but you might be annoying too. <laughs> Don't tell your neighbor that. But, but we are called to love one another. We truly are. How we treat the least of these is a reflection of how we would treat God Almighty. And let me say something really quickly. So many people are like, especially in Western Christianity, they get saved and then they want to go change the world. I want to save the world. I want to transform the world, yada, da, da, da. But people who often talk about changing the world, in my experience, often do the least. All talk, no action. Instead of trying to change the world, let's change the world for somebody. Instead of trying to change the world, let's change somebody's world. Let's encourage them. Let's love them. Let's meet a need that we can meet, let's make a difference for one person breathing air in front of us. You believe what I'm saying today? This is the word of the living God. Second thing I want to show you here is found in verses 23, or excuse me, 22 through 24, and that is this, there is life after death. Tell your neighbor, the one you've been ignoring, say there's life after death. There is life after death. Please hear me. Make no mistake about it, you are an immortal being that exists in a mortal body. You were created in the image and likeness of God Almighty, and your body one day will die. 
The dust will return to the dust from which it was created. But your soul, your spirit will live eternally conscious and aware forever. The day you die and draw your last breath on earth, you will be more alive than you've ever been. You are an immortal being that will exist forever and forever. 10,000 years times 10,000 years, your soul will exist because you were made in the image and the likeness of God. Make no mistake about it. But I want to talk to you for a few moments here about life after death. First thing I want you to take note of right here is Lazarus was forgotten on earth, but he was honored in heaven. He was forgotten on earth, but he was honored in heaven. The Bible says in Luke 16 that both men died, the rich man and Lazarus, they both died. And the rich man was given a funeral that honored his passing. But the Bible says of Lazarus, the poor man, no such burial was given, yet the angels carried him into Abraham's side to dine in the heavenly banquet. In other words, historians tell us that Beggars and those who are in poverty in this time period, when they died, their bodies were just discarded. Earth rejected him, yet heaven honored him. But the man that earth honored, heaven rejected. Matthew chapter 19, verse 30. But many who are the greatest now will be the least important then. And those who seem the least important now will be the greatest then. How many of you guys have ever heard the verse that says, the first shall be last and the last shall be first? We, I quote that every time I'm in a buffet line, right? And I'm at the end. I'm like, well, I will be, I will be first one day, okay? So like, if you're losing in fantasy football, you can pull that quote out. It'll help. You. Anyway, not, not pertaining to the message. What I'm trying to tell you, though, is very important. Heaven doesn't measure success the way you do. What men deem successful doesn't impress or move God. The people that we think are great will be insignificant eternally. And the people we overlooked here and now will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Some of y'all's favorite preachers, your celebrity preachers, they might be the least living on the south side of the kingdom. That was funny and you know it was. Come on, tough crowd here in Levin. These These jokes work. I've already practiced twice, okay? I don't bring the bad jokes to this service, all right? But I'm just trying to tell you, like, Some of the people that we think of are the greatest notable Christians. They will be afterthoughts in eternity, but people who were just faithful, people who were janitors in the church, but were faithful with the sources God gave them, missionaries who left home and comfort and family to go take the gospel to the other side of the world, and nobody ever heard their story. Nobody ever knew their name. They may have been significant on earth. They will be great in the kingdom of heaven. So I want to encourage you today, be faithful. Be faithful in the little things. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Don't live for the applause of men. People will praise you one day and crucify you on Friday. Just ask Jesus. Don't live for the applause of men. Live for the favor of God. And God sees you. Earth may reject you. Earth may overlook you. Earth may not honor you, but God will. Be faithful with what God has put in front of you. And I'm convinced that, I'm convinced that some of these prayer warriors, intercessors, grandmamas that were praying for their families, I think they're going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Half a golf clap, but they're right. Tough crowd, oh well. You know the Bible gives God a name in the Old Testament, El Roy. Or El Roy. Fancy people say El Roy. I'm from West Virginia, so we'll say El Roy. That name means the God who sees, the God who perceives. Your spouse may overlook you, your job may overlook you, but there is a God in the highest heaven who sees you. He not only sees you, he perceives you. He perceives your pain, your anxiety, your pain, your fear. God sees you and he loves you. Live for him, not for the applause of men. The rich man was honored on earth, but he was tormented in hell. Let me hang here for just a minute. You know, we honor everybody at the funeral, and at everybody's funeral, it sounds like everybody made it to heaven. 
Have you ever been to a funeral where the preacher was like, I don't know if he made it? <laughs> right? Like, no, right? Like every funeral you've ever been to is like, yeah, he's such a wonderful person. But y'all know they weren't wonderful. Some of them, okay? <laughs> Relax. No, I'm serious. I, somebody's got to tell you, not everybody is in a better place. Not everybody made it. And I believe it's spiritual malpractice for preachers and priests to stand at a funeral and lie. Let me tell you something, Vision Church. I love you, but I will not lie at your funeral. Some of y'all think I'm playing. I'm not playing. Like, if you don't love Jesus, I'm not going to say you did. No, this is important. I've actually preached the funeral of several unbelievers or agnostic. And can I tell you something? I don't lie at their funeral. Here's what I say. I say, if so-and-so could come back tonight and speak to you, they would tell you, repent and turn to Jesus. If they could say anything to anybody tonight, they would say, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't lie at the funeral. Because earth may honor you, but just because earth honors you doesn't mean you made it. The rich man got the burial, but he was in hell. I promise you, some rabbi probably lied at his funeral. And while I'm already making you uncomfortable and offended, which seems to be my spiritual gift, um, <laughs> I want to talk to you about hell for a minute because nobody does. But do you realize that Jesus talked more about hell and money than almost any other topics? Y'all would not have liked his church. Actually, vision, y'all would have hung in there because I offend you every Sunday and you keep coming. All right, so you would have liked Jesus. You would have liked. All right, but let me tell you what hell is about because you need to be warned. Number one, scripture describes it as a place where you are tormented eternally without mercy. There is no alleviation. There is no break from the suffering. Scripture tells us that there is no rest to be found anywhere in hell. It is constant suffering. The scripture tells us that in hell, it is devoid, it is absent of everything good and perfect. The presence of God is nowhere to be found. I know that there are some reformed friends out there who teach that the Lord is ruling in hell. I understand the verses that they're trying to quote, but the Bible also quite literally verbatim says, God, his presence is not there. Forever, the rich man will be reminded of the things he took for granted, the grace, the peace, the joy, the kindness, the ordinary Wednesdays that he overlooked, the opportunity that he had to trust and call on the name of the Lord. He will forever be reminded of the goodness of God that he took for granted in the land of the living. There are not words in our vocabulary to adequately describe the horrors of hell. It is infinitely worse than anything I could ever articulate to you. The scripture says that it is a place of outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and where the worm never dies. People suffer eternally. They have desires of the flesh that are never satisfied. You still have lustful, prideful, greedy thoughts. You'll still be addicted, strung out, but never relieved. Forever. And if that's not bad enough, let me tell you something. The hell that I'm describing is only temporary. I know everybody's shocked, but it's in the Bible. Do you know that hell is temporary? Because hell gives way to the lake of fire. No, I'm serious. And the lake of fire is far worse than even hell. Listen, the best way that I can describe it to you is comparing prison to jail. Hopefully, you can't relate, but if you get incarcerated, they immediately take you to jail. And jail, from what I hear, is not bad, not, not great, not fun. Not, it's not good. But prison is worse. And you know what's in between jail and prison? Your trial, your judgment, your sentencing. This is exactly what the Bible portrays about life beyond death. 
Those who die without Christ immediately go to hell where there is suffering. But eventually, hell will give up its dead in it and they will stand before the judgment seat of the maker of heaven and earth to give an account for their life on earth. And those who had rejected Christ will then be thrown into the lake of fire forever and forever. No second chances, no doing it again, no mercy. Lake of fire, infinitely worse than hell. Please hear me, hell was never created for you. Matthew's gospel says that it was designed for Satan and the fallen angels who rebelled along with him. God's will is that none of you would perish, but that everyone would come to the saving knowledge of his son, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but find life everlasting. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that Jesus died for every whosoever would call upon his name. He didn't just die for the elite or the rich or the religious. He died for any whosoever would humble themselves, repent, and call upon his name. God does not send anyone to hell. We send ourselves by rejecting his son, Jesus Christ. What more do you want God to do for you? There is no greater love than this. I hear people say, well, if God were real, why does he just come down and reveal himself? He did. 2,000 years ago, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. As we beheld Jesus, we beheld the, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. When we saw Christ, we saw God. He's paid the price for you in full. There is no reason for anyone in this building at Independence or online, there's no reason for any of you to perish in hell eternally. Repent of your sin and trust in Jesus Christ. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Can I get a witness of somebody who's grateful for the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ? We will eternally, Luke 16 reveals that we will eternally be conscious. Listen to this. The rich man recognized Lazarus. I've heard people ask, they're like, well, when I die, will I recognize anybody? Yes. The rich man recognized Lazarus. (laughs) Some of you are like, man, I wish I got a new face, right? It's like, no, they will recognize you. The rich man also remembered his family, and he remembered the life that he lived here on earth. I think that's part of the torment, is that forever and forever, he will be reminded of what could have been. He will be reminded of the mercy that he could have called on, but he was so selfish, so self-centered, so distracted, that God was never even a thought in his life. Scripture tells us that We will be aware, cognitively aware in conscience forever. Listen, the Bible does not teach soul sleep, where they're just sleeping. The Bible does not teach annihilation, like the Jehovah's Witnesses do, where there will be a temporary alleviating, alleviation of suffering. No, there's no annihilation. And the Bible does not teach reincarnation. So no, you're not going to come back as a butterfly. Stop it. I talk to people and say, well, you know, my next life, I'm going to come back as this. No. That's dumb. And somebody just needs to tell you. Somebody's like, oh, well, it's, it's dumb. And you should stop thinking that. The new age stuff you're, in your crystals and your Buddhas, that's not going to save you. Nobody else died for you on a cross, by the way. And nobody else had the power to take back their life again. We're all betting with our lives. But the reason we can trust in Jesus is he laid down his life and had the power three days later to take it back again. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't place my soul in the hands of a prophet who's unable to save himself. Think about it. And the Bible does not teach purgatory where souls can be cleansed and prayed for and sanctified in the afterlife to one day make it to the highest heaven. 
That's Catholicism. And to my Catholic friends, don't send me an email, but you're wrong. There is no such thing. The Bible simply does not account for this. These are teachings of men. Do you realize that in the afterlife, these two men traded places? The rich man became the beggar, and the beggar became the rich man. Do you realize it? In Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, it says, You say that I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. These are the words of Jesus. So if you think my sermons are rough, you can talk to him. The rich aren't as rich as they seem. No, I'm serious. And um, Mark 8, 36 says, what shall it profit a man if he gains the entire world, but he loses his own soul? True wealth is knowing Jesus. That is true wealth. Let me say something to you. I've heard people misapply this text, and it grieves my soul, and so I have to tell you that that they're wrong. And here's what they say. They say, well, you know, the reason that the men switched places and the reason Lazarus was saved is because he was poor, so God blessed him in the afterlife. And then they'll say, well, the reason the rich man went to hell is because he was rich. False. That's heretical teaching. False teaching. Lazarus did not make it to heaven because he was poor any more than the rich man went to hell for being rich. Lazarus went to Abraham's side of salvation because he had faith in God. (laughs) You got your enthusiasm is overwhelming. Um, (laughs) No, no, no. The Old Testament saints are saved the same way you're saved, by God's grace through faith. How do we know this? Hebrews chapter 11 tells us, The prophets of old, Abraham was declared righteous by faith. David saved by faith. All of the Old Testament patriarchs were saved not by their good works or because they were poor. They were saved by faith. Listen, it's not a sin to be rich, but it's a sin when nice things have you. Oh, and there's a big difference. Nothing wrong with being wealthy, nothing wrong with having nice things, just so long as nice things don't have you. And there is a big difference when they become your idol. One other reason we know that Lazarus was saved by faith is because his very name means God is my help. Man, what a good name, Lazarus. God is my help. In other words, I'm not self-reliant. I'm not independent. I am reliant and resting upon the, the work of God to save me. The Lord is my help. I'm gonna say something that may shock you, but it's, I'm, I'm gonna do it. Do you realize that our circumstances can make it easier or more difficult to come to God? No, I'm serious. Life is not fair. Tell your neighbor, life is not fair. Somebody's mind just blown right there. Like, wow, so it's deep preaching. Life is not fair. It's not fair. And somebody needs to tell you. Do you realize the Bible tells you life is not fair? The Bible literally says it rains on the just and the unjust alike. The sun shines on the just and the wicked. Literally tells you life is not fair. And some of us, have an easier path to God than others. You don't like that preaching, but it's true because Jesus taught it. It's Matthew chapter 19. Listen to this. Let me ask you a question before I read it. Who has the harder path to God, the rich or the poor? The rich have the more difficult path to God. The Bible tells you this. Jesus warns you. By the way, by the way, when you hear this, that the rich have a difficult path, Jesus said it's very, di- it's very difficult for the rich to enter into the kingdom of heaven. When we hear that, we all, because I know if you're like me, I'm like, well, yeah, the guy with like three commas in their bank account, they're rich. The guy with a yacht, he's rich. We can always think of somebody who's richer than we are, and we think that's who the Bible's talking about. But I want to let you know, the Bible's talking to you. Tell your neighbor you're rich. 
Somebody's like, in Jesus' name, I name it and claim it. You know? <laughs> this isn't that kind of church. Calm down. All right. All right. But no, no, no. You're rich. Do you realize that even the poorest in America are wealthy on a global standard? I'm serious. I got stories about that, but I'll save it for another day. You're the rich. Now listen to what Jesus says. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 19, verse 23. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth. It is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say it again. In other words, Jesus is saying for everybody in the back, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to inherit the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. Can I tell you why it's harder for the rich people to come to Christ? Because they think they have need of nothing. Many of them are self-sufficient, self-reliant, they pride themselves on being a self-made man, a self-made woman. I don't need God. I don't need the Lord. I'm good. That's what Jesus said to the church at Revelation in Laodicea. You think you're rich. You think you have need of nothing, but you are poor, miserable, wretched, blind, and naked. You think you're rich, but you're actually in a great detriment. Another reason the rich have a harder path to the kingdom of heaven is because they're distracted. They have a lot of things to distract them. A lot of things to have fun with, a lot of material things to occupy their time, distracted from the true and living God. And I want to remind you that every one of us in this place, we are the rich. But can I tell you something? Some of you in this place, please hear me. Your disadvantage is actually your advantage. I'm trying to talk to somebody. I pray you hear me. Your disadvantage is actually your advantage. You know why? The poor man, Lazarus, actually had an advantage because he couldn't buy his way out of it. He couldn't network his way out of trouble. All he had to depend on, all he could cry out to was the Lord, his God. That's the reason his disadvantage became an advantage. But please hear me. The rich and the poor are saved the same way. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but our, we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Just the poor are aware they're in need. There are no second chances. Tell your neighbor, there are no second chances. The first night in hell, the rich man realized for the first time that life was not about himself. For the first time, he began to think about the needs of others. And he called out to Abraham, his spiritual father. He said, Abraham, send Lazarus back to my father's house because I have five brothers who are lost and in need. If you'll raise him from the dead, then surely they will repent and believe. And Abraham responded, if your brothers will not believe Moses and the prophets, they will not believe if even the dead come back to life. What did Abraham mean when he said, if they won't believe Moses and the prophets? That was a saying for the scriptures. In other words, Abraham said to the rich man, your family has the scripture. They have the word of God, which is entirely sufficient to save. And if your family will reject the scripture, your family will reject any sign that comes from heaven or earth. Let me tell you something. The greatest thing God could give you aside from his son is not a sign in heaven, but the word of the living God. The scripture is enough. The scripture points to salvation in Jesus Christ. Please hear me. The world is does not reject the scripture because it is insufficient. They do not reject the scripture because it is scientifically, historically, or prophetically unreliable. No, they reject the scripture. They suppress it because they don't want to believe it. Because believing the scripture dethrones them as the God of their own life, and many are their own idol. 
Romans 1 says they suppress the truth of God and their minds grow all the darker. There are countless reasons, infinite reasons to believe in the God of the Bible. The reason they don't is they don't want to. But let me tell you, he is the hope of the world and his scripture reveals the path of salvation. In closing, there is only one way to be saved. Tell your neighbor, only one way. Now I pray that you lean in to this closing point of Luke 16. What I read to you is, there's a theological nuance here. In Luke chapter 16, this is before the cross of Calvary. I told you that the righteous who died before Jesus were saved the same way you are, by God's grace through faith, right? But they didn't know the name Jesus. So when Abraham, Isaac, David, Isaiah, Daniel, when they died, they did not go to heaven in the presence of the Father. No, instead, they went to a place called Abraham's side or Abraham's bosom. This is where Catholicism drives the doctrine of purgatory. The Bible said it was a place of temporary holding for the righteous dead. Listen to this, 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also suffered once for the sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits that were in prison. We know that Jesus died and for three days his body lied in the tomb, we seldom ask the question, what was he doing during the three days? Watch this, Ephesians sheds a little more light. Ephesians 4, 8. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. And he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fulfill all things. The Bible is literally telling you, as Jesus gave up his life on the cross and said, it is finished, immediately he descended into the lower parts of the earth to Abraham's side. And he preached to the righteous souls who were waiting. And he said, I'm the Messiah, the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the Lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world. He gave gifts unto men, and he led captivity captive, and he brought them safely into the presence of God Almighty. Why is this here? Because now forever and always, there's only one way to the Father. It's not by good works, it's not by religion, but by Christ alone. We come to the presence of the Father. Even Abraham, even David, even Daniel had to wait on the precious blood of Christ to come boldly before the throne of glory. The Bible is phenomenal, inspired of the Holy Spirit. And today, there is still only one way to heaven. Now you don't have to wait. You don't have to go to purgatory. You don't have to go to Abraham's side. Now, thanks to Jesus and his shed blood, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Pray with me all over this place and at Independence. Father, we come to you right now in Jesus' name and we repent of our sin. We acknowledge that all of us have sinned and come short of your glory. God, we've all rebelled, transgressed. It's been treason in the highest degree. God, we knew sin was wrong. We just didn't know how wrong it actually was. But today, we ask for mercy. Forgive us for our lust, our pride, our jealousy, our greed, and our selfish ambition. Today, we believe that Jesus died on the cross. His blood was shed to take away the sin of the world. He is my salvation, and in him I trust. To the cross I cling. Change my heart, O oh God, and make me new. Help me to follow you and serve you all the days of my life. And may my life never be the same again. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.